Welcome to AJA Lunchtime Live. I'm Kimberly Carroll. I'm the AJA Director. Our topic today is Women Reinventing the Food System. Welcome to all you beautiful beings here with us live and welcome to those of you who are watching the replay. Now, Jennifer Stoikovic is a multi-talented executive leader in food technology and investment, policy and advocacy. She's also founder of the wildly successful Vegan Women's Summit, VWS, a global platform of more than 40,000 women leaders. And this was just started two years, folks, uh, dedicated to building a kinder and more sustainable world. Um, Jenny has built her career as a leading advocate for tech policy and innovation in Silicon Valley, um, working with world's tech giants like um, Google and Microsoft, Uber. Um, and Jenny is a frequent contributor to Rolling Stone magazine. She's written some incredible articles you need to check out. Uh, she's also an internationally featured public speaker, and she regularly appears in national press, including the Washington Post, Bloomberg, and Political. Uh, and we are going to have all the links to find out more about Jenny. But first of all, Jenny, welcome. Hello, hello. There's so much going on here. I was checking every link as you were explaining everything going on. I'm like, is this my writing? You know, going through everything. <laughs> you guys are a busy group. I'm excited to be here. Oh, well, thank you, Jenny. We are, we know how busy you are. You have been on a whirlwind tour. Of, you went right from the, the Vegan Women's uh, Women's Summit to a whirlwind promoting your book tour. So just to be able to have a little bit of our, our, your time makes us very happy. Um, and first of all, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you're a Canadian gal. I am, yes. Uh, so I see there's a lot of Canadians in the audience. Uh, I grew up in a little town called Innisfil, if anyone's familiar. So I yes. um, spent, spent the first 17 years of my life there in a very, very tiny town. So small, it doesn't even have a McDonald's. Apparently it's now huge. Uh, and I went to school at uh, what was Ryerson, now Toronto Metropolitan University and um, headed to the States to build my career when I was 21. Amazing. What a go-getter. I'm also a, Metropol a Toronto Metropolitan University grad as well. Probably many years before you though. <laughs> <laughs> Um, We're a small but mighty constituent, you know. We there's, are. There's a we few are. Of us. I think uh, uh, Eric McCormick from Will and Grace. We have him too. You know, there's a few of us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, Jenny. So much that we want to pick your brain about. Um, first of all, I mean, it's fascinating. You went to at 21. You you headed to California. Can you share a little bit about your journey going from Silicon Valley to food tech expert, the food tech expert you are today? Yeah, absolutely. So I have had an interesting journey into the future of food. So to just kind of give a little bit of context, I personally went vegan uh, eight years ago. Yeah. So I have been passionately very much a part of this movement from like a, sitting on boards and, and, you know, being involved from a philanthropic standpoint for a very long time. But it wasn't until a few years ago that I was actually able to bridge my professional and personal passions, which has been the most exciting, um, you know, time of my life to be completely honest so uh -huh. I built my career in Silicon Valley working with everybody from you know Facebook to Uber to Google all the biggest tech companies in the world and my goal is, is really always been to advocate for innovation and it was you know a wild ride I was actually brought on after the post 2008 boom so that's like the modern tech industry that you know today your Airbnbs and TaskRabbit and um, essentially the gig economy, Uber, Lyft, all of that. Um, so I really cut my teeth in this completely new disruptive world where uh, if you remember, especially those of you that are in Canada, you probably remember like the taxi protests. You remember how crazy it was uh, mm -hmm. when these new tech companies kind of made it onto the scene. And there's a lot of analogies, I think, um, with the future food system and the disruption that we're gonna see in these next few years to what it was like um, in my first career. So mm -hmm. what's been exciting though is yeah, yeah, there's a lot. I can talk about that a lot um, later. But what's been exciting is in 2018 or so, there started to be a lot more mainstream attention paid to the food industry, the food technology space. So I started bridging together my work with um, big CEOs in the tech space and investors and started introducing them to the big food tech leaders in the space. So um, people like Uma Valetti or Josh Tetrick or, or Bruce from GFI, they're all, you know, close old friends of mine. And I've decided that if we were going to um, really kind of make this the next big tech industry, we had to almost pass the baton um, in a way. So I started doing some programming then in 18 or so, um, built it up more and more, um, started getting some really big recognition in the space. And unfortunately started to look around and realize that 
all of this amazing work we were putting together, all these amazing CEOs and leaders we were working with, they were all dudes. All of them were dudes. And yeah. it was, uh, you know, it was an interesting realization for me because coming from the tech industry, uh, I'm surrounded predominantly by men. Uh, that's what kind of the tech bro culture is, so to speak. And so uh, I started to kind of see this opportunity for us as the food tech industry, as this completely new burgeoning industry, we have the ability to course correct and actually put the concerted effort into making sure that we have a diverse and inclusive um, future of food. And so that's really where the impetus for VWS was born. And much of the work that I've built from VWS, which we launched two and a bit years ago, has really been how can I take everything that I've learned from tech and bring it towards the future of food, increase the innovation, increase the disruption, but do it with inclusivity in mind. Mm, love every bit of that. And, and so Jenny, uh, there's the, like, I really want to talk about um, the, uh, the reason and all of, all of the reasons that it's so important to bust this paradigm and create a new one. Um, but I, uh, as far as um, uh, inclusivity, However, I want to talk, first of all, uh, about the transformation of our food system, okay? You talk about it as one of the most pressing issues that humanity faces. So tell us more about this. I mean, I think, I think we're all probably here pretty convinced, but especially for us that are talking to others, what are some of the things we got to hit around this? Oh, boy, where do I start? So, I mean, we all know from an ethical standpoint, this, this is by far and large, like, you know, among the greatest atrocities that have ever happened. So we don't need to talk about that. We know what we do to animals is terrible and we need to change it, right? Um, what I focus on is, you know, where are those solutions and how can we make those accessible? Um, how can we make those desirable and how can we make those cost effective, right? Um, so the best example I give to folks when it comes to talking about the food system and the transformation needed is um, quite honestly, you can see in my reflection, I'm sitting here in the hills of Los Angeles. Um, these hills, you can see they're going pretty brown. That's because we're out of water. We're down to a third of our water reserves in California. Keep in mind, California is a state that's 40 million people. It's bigger than the entire country of Canada. And I literally got a notice like a month ago and most at Los um, Angelinos did of we are now going to ration the water again because we are in a drought. And when I talk to people about this, they're very shocked to hear the way that we use our water, the way that we use our resources. So just to give you an example of where I am, 80% um, of all of California's water is used for agriculture, which produces 2% of the state's GDP. 80% of the water to produce 2% of the state's GDP. And what's even more um, shocking for folks to learn is that not only is there obviously a massive em environmental footprint for animal agriculture, of course, but the actual agriculture that we're growing, um, non-animal agriculture, is also going towards animals. So the most water intensive crop in California is alfalfa. So the news would have you to believe that it's almonds because everyone, we all saw, remember three or four years ago, the villainizing of like almonds, it was everywhere, you know, almond milk's yes. the devil, blah, 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 right? <laughs> and of course, I can tell you all about how the meat and dairy industry actually planted that. I'm sure all of you know that. There's a lot of these, you know, um, very specific, you know, conspiracies that do happen and a number of them that have been proven um, on behalf of animal ag. And so I am going around telling people like, you know, it's actually alfalfa. And here's what's shocking to, to find out, that alfalfa doesn't go towards humans. That alfalfa that we are using all of the water that we don't have as humans here, it's actually going towards growing a plant that is then thrown on a ship and sent all the way over to China to feed their pigs. That's where most of the alfalfa in the state of California goes. Unbelievable. There's Unbelievable. a little for you. This yeah. is like a little microcosm of how messed up the system is. And yeah. you can extrapolate and pull from that what you will. I mean, there's a, these same stories are happening everywhere. You know, you can go over to North Carolina and take a look at like the lagoons and, um, you know, you can take a look at the fact that one of the biggest meat producers in America is, is owned by a, you know, Hong Kong conglomerate that's owned through China. Like we are using up our resources in North America to ship food all the way over to, to Asia. Like it's just, it's like one yeah. environmental hit after another. Yeah. And to feed, you know, animals that should not even exist because, <laughs> you know, we don't need to eat them. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, 
It is. So we, so it is, and it's, uh, I mean, I don't even get me started on how the media doesn't, doesn't like understand or report this. I, I mean, I just read today about um, an article about uh, the Netherlands right now. Farmers are, are big uprising because they're trying mm -hmm. to cut fertilizer use. And that's, that's an issue that's happening in Canada too. Um, and no mention of the fact that most of this fertilizer is being used to grow crops to feed animals like it's just and I really just don't think they know so um so you know the whole food tech movement I mean got really exciting in the last couple of years um there was a huge rise in the market for protein alternatives um uh, you know it was like a plant-based products boom and now there's all these articles saying, speaking of the media, um, the huge growth that they were projecting has flattened. Um, and so what's your take on like, how is food tech actually doing in the market? Um, and should we be worried? There's a lot to unpack here. And this is probably the number one question that I get asked these days. So first off, the investment boom that we saw in the last few years is indicative of the entire market. There was a massive investment boom across, you know, everything from Web3 and crypto to alternative proteins. Like there was a massive amount of money thrown into everything. Um, and that is largely because COVID threw us into a very wild economy and a very interesting market where um, there was an unprecedented amount of cash that was flowing. Uh, the cash had to go somewhere. And you know, a lot of it was also printed you know, from our governments as stimulus money, both in Canada, the US and beyond. And so um, that is something we saw across the board in terms of booms. Now, in terms of the actual like market itself as it stands today, we are seeing a downturn, uh, much like everybody is seeing a downturn. Uh, we take a look at Beyond and Oatly. There are only two tickers you know, on major exchanges right now. So keep in mind, there is like, over 500 publicly traded major tech companies um, on like the stock exchange, yet we have two for the plant-based space. And rather than, you know, taking this like higher level approach to what's the entire ecosystem look like considering 99% of the ecosystem is still a private company, you see the media focus on two public companies because that's the only ones where they can get any data. So it's mm -hmm. super important that you understand this, that when you hear about Beyond and Oatly, that's not talking about all of these other massive billion dollar plus companies like, you know, Impossible Foods and others. You know, I work privately with many of them and you're not seeing those numbers. So don't let the media skew you into believing that just because two companies are having issues of performance, which is across the board with many companies that were in a, in a lull. Now, demand has flatlined a lot and demand has flatlined for a lot of different CPG products as well. Um, there was a big influx of, of plant-based products that hit the market all at once. And, you know, it, it was, it was a little bit troublesome because there was a fight for shelf space and there was an influx of money that was going in. And I'll be completely honest, Kimberly, um, as somebody that, you know, I'm also a VC in the space building a fund right now, there's some money and some checks that got cut from, you know, investors that perhaps shouldn't have cut them. And there's valuations that were freaking ridiculous. Uh, some of the valuations we saw of these early stage companies that were pre-revenue, you know, they should have been maybe a 3x multiplier for their valuation. They were getting a 10x multiplier. And that was largely because of the insanity of COVID when everybody had all of this money and they had to figure out how to deploy that capital really, really quickly. Um, so I believe what we're going to see in these next um, 18 months, we're going to see some market consolidation as we go into this downturn. Uh, you are going to see companies that that go bust. Like, let me be clear to everybody. There's going to be plant-based companies that go bust. Um, there's going to be acquisitions, probably a lot of acquisitions. Um, we're actually heavily incentivizing, you know, the brands that do have cash on hand. Like now is a great time to build out your portfolio. Um, if you look at how every major food company in the world operates, they have a massive portfolio of many different brands. And uh, many of them actually like have competing brands within their portfolio. And that's something we've been talking to a lot of these larger companies about is, you know, hey, Beyond Burger, you know, if you've got all this cash on hand, have you thought about picking up these plant-based, you know, meat companies that have a completely different consumer segment than you? And then you can really start to own the shelf, so to speak. Um, so that's just a little bit of like insight, like on the DL of like what we're all kind of focusing on in the industry, uh, in terms of like, is this normal for any new industry? It absolutely is. Um, I encourage folks to take a look and you can look up the S curve of innovation. Um, it's an entrepreneurship model that we have seen this kind this type of S curve in any new disruptive market, right? It booms and then goes down and then it rises much steadily 
uh, much more steady to a much larger peak. So we just had our first little mini peak. There's a lot more to come. Oh my God. Um, Carrie is saying in the chat, this is such an amazing session. So much great information. Jenny is so well informed. Yes, you are. You're brilliant. Love you. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and thank you because, uh, you know, this not um, sort of market oriented person, uh, it, you know, was getting a little worried, like what's happening here. Um, and so, um, so that's very reassuring. And um, normal. <laughs> it's normal. It's normal. Oh, it's normal. It's all good. I'm telling you, like, yeah, we yeah. have almost like I have built my career in industries that were like hanging on by a thread many, many, many times. Like this is what disruption looks like. This is what innovation looks like. It's messy and terrifying. Mm. Yes, it is. Just like everything around animal advocacy. So I, we're used to it. That's the good thing. <laughs> we're not snowflakes when it comes to this. <laughs> Um, so Jenny, I mean, as far as um, demand goes um, and the flatlining of demand, I've heard talk before about veganism and plant-based having a branding problem. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, it's no secret that we put billions of dollars into, you know, burgers that are less than like 20% of our meat consumption. We really heavily focus a lot of our food uh, investments early on in the space into the American diet. Uh, fun fact for, you know, folks, a lot of you probably, does everybody here remember 10 years ago that really infamous um, $250,000 lab grown hamburger? Yes. Does everybody remember that moment, right? There are lot, lots of <laughs> nodding heads, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that burger that Sergey Brin, you know, funded Mark Post, who now has a cultivated meat company over in Europe um, to build, you know, that was originally supposed to be pork, so here's like an inside little um, little story. So mm. Mark was a cardiologist by trade. That's that's what his background is. And, and pork is much more similar to humans. Um, and so he actually had an entire pork sausage is what they were supposed to debut. And Sergey said, no, if we are gonna debut this, we need it to be the American food. What is the American food staple? What does everybody around the world think Americans eat five times a day? Yeah. It's a hamburger. Right. So the hamburger is what really kind of became synonymous with meat in, in North America, largely, right? Canadian beef, same thing. Mm. And so we put so much money into beef, 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 beyond burgers and impossible burgers and all of that. And we largely left out a lot of, you know, other types of foods. Now we're starting to see the chicken boom, which any of you folks, you know, especially from like an effective altruism lens, you know, that chickens by far and large have a much bigger impact and much larger suffering than, and, and we consume way, way, way more of them than beef to begin with, right? So we didn't really focus our efforts on decentralizing this investment to reach all palates. And that's also largely, you know, showcased in the types of brands that were funded. They're all standard, you know, American type foods and it excluded entire cultures. Um, I'm here in Los Angeles, which is a Hispanic majority city. Um, not an English speaking majority city, you know, Spanish is, is the, you know, more commonly heard uh, in most of, of the neighborhoods that I'm in these days. And there is not even like a single major plant based producer for any like Hispanic, you know, um, culturally significant foods, right? Um, we're now seeing like the rise of black veganism. And, you know, I think black vegans are about three times more likely, uh, or black Americans are three times more likely to go vegan than white Americans. Uh, again, very few brands were being funded in this space. Uh, now you're seeing things like um, Danita from Everything Legendary. She's building an entire plant-based burger brand that's just killing it. She just got like the uh, Live Nation contract to do all the concerts um, for Live yeah. Nation next year all across the country. And her entire consumer constituent group is it's Black Americans eating, you know, foods that make sense to them. Pinky Cole is a good friend of mine. 98% um, of her clientele are African Americans. 98% are not vegan. Uh, there's there's just this new surgence of people that are starting to speak to their own communities. And um, as I write in my book, it's ridiculous that we've left them this out of the conversation, to be completely honest, um, especially women in particular. Uh, women are like anywhere between 70 to 90 percent of the consumer buyers. Um, we are the ones that buy food. And we are not the ones that are making the foods that go on our plates. You know, so there's a very compelling reason from a competitive advantage standpoint as to why we need to diversify the people that are making the future of food. There's also uh, just, just to like also tap on a completely different cultural phenomenon. Um, there's a lot of fear and mistrust of science in certain communities for obvious reasons. Um, you know, 
Black Americans in the anti-vax movement and um, Hispanic uh, Americans as well. Like we need to ensure that we are having the right conversations from the very beginning about what future fluid technologies look like to all of these groups that have historically been marginalized by you know, medical science and things like that. Um, we need to get ahead of that problem like yesterday. Uh. And very few people talk about that as well. Yeah, I mean, it's not just women that you're championing to lead through um, all of your efforts. I, th I think a huge mission for you is to make sure that people of color are also leading the food system uh, reform. Um, and I think I think most of us here know that there just are so many reasons um, that this is an, a vital thing. But can you give us the rundown of some of the other, um, you know, compelling uh, reasons for the overall animal, you know, uh, freedom movement, why we need to be um, including the global majority in food system reform? There is so much we can look at from both locally and globally as to why this is this needs to be a part of it. So locally speaking, we are completely like we have these massive untapped communities um, that are very quickly becoming, you know, very large parts of the population. Like Texas is going to be, you know, a, Lat a Latino Hispanic majority state very soon. I think within the next two elections, like there, you know, the the diversity and the globalization of what North America, Canada as well. You know, Toronto is very similar as well. Yeah. We need to make sure that we are being culturally inclusive in terms of these brands that we're building and the products that we're creating we're gonna completely alienate entire groups of people that represent large populations. Um, from a larger kind of taking a bird's eye view of the entire world, we are having massive, massive economic shifts in the world, um, you know, even looking at like Asia. If you take a look at the rise of meat consumption in China, for instance, you know, this is a country that historically consumed extremely low amounts of meat. And as they have reached affluence and the average consumer has much more money, they've looked at North Americans and we want to eat like you. And that has been one of the biggest problems that we've had. I mean, they have multi, you all know this, they have like, you know, actual like multi-floor buildings that they're factory farming pigs in just to keep up with the demand. Um, and there's also, you know, from a even like long, longer term view, Africa it, within the next few decades, more than 50% of Africans are going to be middle class. Mm -hmm. Again, if we, if, if the continent of Africa sees the same shifts that the continent of Asia has in terms of changing their meat consumption to, to you know, mirror what they see here in the West, we're, we're out of resources. Like, let's yeah. be clear, the Absolutely. sheer numbers and the demand, if they continue to follow what they historically have, that's it. Like it's game over for us. We are not going to be from a antibiotic resistance, from a pandemic perspective, from a water shortage perspective, from a deforestation perspective. Like the world cannot continue to feed people in this way. And we cannot continue to uphold this insane standard of, of eating meat three times a day in North America. And if we don't get our act together, we're just basically going to you know, show to the rest of the world, like, yes, you know, please, you know, ramp up and, and consume the same amount of animal products. Mm. Well, and, and, you know, there's also, uh, as you speak of, uh, a lot of these low income countries are looking to high income countries to say, oh, well, this is what status looks like. Um, but meanwhile, over here in, in North America, we are also trying to dispel the stigma that veganism is like a, a, a privileged white person thing, right? Um, so there's a lot of different levels going on here. Um, and, and so one of the things um, that I remember hearing uh, you say in an interview was that 75% of, of Black folks are lactose intolerant. And so here we are, we have this entire um, peoples that are like that dairy is toxic to and yet we are basically throwing it down their throats from the minute they're born yeah absolutely um so first off debbie i see your question there i'll just tell you really fast they essentially have shoots for the manure that goes down kind of like your laundry chute or your garbage chute at a high rise um just to oh, answer that one thank so, you okay Let's talk about the massive racism in the food system. Many of you are probably experts in this space, so I don't need to you know, preach to the choir here, but they say upwards of like 90% of black babies that are born, it's even higher than 75% by some estimates. It could be as high as 90% are lactose intolerant. Um, you know, same with the Asian community. Like there is entire 
swaths of, of babies that are being born and they have little to no options for what to consume when they're born because um, the vast majority, it's like, I think it's something like um, only 25% of infants in the United States even make it to like the recommended six months of breastfeeding. And six months of breastfeeding, by the way, as you all know, is, is on the very, very lowest end. You know, World Health Organization says up to three years. So even the very bare minimum of breastfeeding, most babies are not going to even have access to that um, because largely um, black and brown women are very, very unlikely to have paid parental leave to begin with. Um, so there is no paid parental leave standard across the United States. I mean, California has one and certain states have done things, but federally speaking, there does there is no paid maternity leave like there is in um, Canada, for instance. So these babies are put on formula from the earliest days. And it is formula that is literally like poisoning their, their, their guts. Like it is, it's terrible, terrible for them. And so that type of inherent racism that's built into the food system is something I actually talk about in the book. We talk about the massive disparities and why cultivated um, and cultured breast, breast milk in particular is extremely important. And then of course we saw the infant formula shortage, which we also talked about in the book a year and a half ago that we saw it coming because there was little to no investment into alternatives for infants until very recently. Mm. Okay, uh, you know, I, I want to uh, dive into the book, um, but but before we do, one of the really inspiring stories in the book of uh, is is about a company called Biomilk that addresses just this. So can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, so Biomilk is, is literally creating a, a breast milk alternative. So currently, as we all know, this is something that when we wrote the book, it wasn't too known, but nowadays we understand a little bit more about what's going on with the infant formula industry. Most infant formula um, still continues to be like dairy based. There's very, 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 very few um, high quality plant based alternatives. Elf's Nutrition, I think, is one of the only ones that has even made um, a number of the standards, which is like a high quality plant based infant nutrition company that's come out of Israel. I think they're in the US and Canada now. But largely, like we basically got dairy infant formula. That's it. And they estimate that about 10% of the global liquid dairy market is um, infant formula. Okay, I want to stop you there because this is a figure that we all should hear, okay? We're all going after everybody and putting milk in their cereal, but that 10% of the dairy supply in the world goes towards infant fo formula, huge. Yeah. yeah, so 10% of the global liquid dairy market, it's a huge, huge um, driver of, of dairy and again, left out of the conversation most of the time and so and that's largely you know nestle basically created infant formula they're the ones that kind of like have a stronghold on the industry we saw a lot of those breaks in recent months because of the you know disruptions that happened in infant formula shortage in particular in the united states so we need an alternative and uh, this is actually a really great example of gender bias and in investing in the food space uh, a lot of people think that we are a progressive industry that you know doesn't have some of the same issues that other industries do and we absolutely do. We have many of the same issues. 95% of all venture capitalists are men, 5% are women. And so the lived experience of being a mother is something that very few investors will have. So when you're pitching them on, you know, cultivated breast milk, most of the time investors, it doesn't resonate with them because they don't understand it. Um, there's a little bit more awareness nowadays, but I have, I've worked with a number of companies, Biomilk being one of them, that have been pitching for years about the massive infant formula crisis and the need for these breast milk alternatives. It's only now you're starting to see them get investment. Um, there's also a few other companies as well focused on it. Um, and there's also people that are focusing on similar technology for dairy as a whole. Amazing. Okay, so Jenny, you created this huge vegan women's summit a couple of years ago. Um, and, and this we were talking about this platform of 40,000 women leaders. And now this book, The Future of Food is Female, which just arrived on my doorstep <laughs> uh, late, but oh, better late than never. Um, what has drawn you so passionately? Um, I mean, you have talked about what's drawn you passionately to this space. But um, you know, uh, why did you feel like you were the person that kind of needed to bring this to the forefront? Why was this your, your mission? I have a theory that if we can tap into the resources, expertise, and potential of the nearly 4 billion women on the planet, we can solve the crisis that's facing us with the food system. I like to tell people, the longer we leave the talents and skills of women on the table, the longer we leave animals on the table. 
I believe that we just have a ton of untapped potential out there, whether they're founders, whether they are um, talent that could be getting into the space, whether they're investors, whether they're consumer advocates, there's an entire population that is just not being engaged. And that is what I seek to change. Mm. Now, um, so let's uh, talk a little bit. Let's get into the book even more. Um, so you are, um, you've got, you're, you're featuring a, a bunch of movers and shakers in this space. Um, it's a real impress impressive collection. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about the women who you explore between the covers of your book? So I reached out to women across the world. So we've got women from six different continents in the book, everyone from CEOs and founders and entrepreneurs to scientists to, we have a member of the European Parliament in the book. I also talked to a number of celebrities as well. And it's really just about how are these women that are leading all around the world, um, building the change that we need to see in the world. Some of them are, are women that you'll probably be familiar with, like um, Miyoko Shinner or Heather Mills or, you know, Daniela Monet, like some of them have very, you know, high profiles, but some of them do not. And I, I don't believe that we have had, you know, a fair shake at, at media portrayal. Mm -hmm. I very, 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 very often write into Bloomberg and, uh, and Washington Post and LA Times and Guardian and The Independent and whoever it is, when they have future food coverage, I very seldom see women founders that are represented in that coverage. Still to this day, you know, a week ago I found a piece and I have an actual um, stock template where I write and I say, hi, I love this article that you wrote. Here are three women that you should have included in it. Please let me know if you want to be connected. Um, the media is just like still continues to largely leave many of these women out. And so I thought that, you know, if nobody's going to write a book featuring women in the future of food, I will do it. And that's exactly um, why I focused on so many of these women, especially women of color. I think it's like 70 or 80% of the women in the book are women of color. Many of them came from nothing. Um, Priyanka Srinivas, who's got a, a chapter towards the end of the book, was literally born in an Indian slum um, with a hole in a roof that she used to star, stare at the um, stars. You know, some of these women came from literally nothing and mm. have built massive, massive companies. So they deserve the, the credit and I'm going to give it to them. And so we are, we've already talked about biomilk. Can you um, share some of the, the food tech um, pieces that come out in your book um, that you're, you're especially excited about? Yes, yeah, so my book covers, uh, we do some policy and some kind of um, larger picture stuff, but for the vast majority, we cover technologies in the future of food, everything from um, artificial intelligence and how it can improve the food system, uh, to, you know, plant-based innovation, lots of plant-based innovation, uh, to lots of cultivated meat and precision fermentation as well. I think it's very important for all of us in this room. If we want to see a change in the food system, we need to be very well acquainted with the technologies that can bring that change. Uh, I find that many different, um, you know, I find that many different people that I speak to, you know, sometimes from the nonprofit side, they um, they don't necessarily understand the technology. So I wrote the book in a way that you can actually kind of have a guidebook to what's going on so you can speak and understand intelligibly about what these innovations are. So yeah, we don't have to go to our tech nerd friends and get them to translate for us. No, you've got, I mean, the book will explain what's cultivated meat, and, you know, it'll explain precision fermentation, it'll explain AI, it'll explain what are some of the different ways that plant protein is being held back, all that fun stuff. Yeah, and I think you know a lot of us here are in the um, the advocacy space uh, and the nonprofit space, and so this isn't a place that well, it's certainly not my expertise at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, first of all, it gives me so much hope to hear you talk, and whenever I'm, I'm hearing you know um, leaders in the move in that movement talk, and um, and to be able to you know as advocates, we're always going to have pushback. We're going to give them the reasons why they should go plant based, but then they're like, well you know, they have a, a hundred excuses, why not? And so to be able to know the technology that's on the horizon, incredible. You know, Jenny, I remember um, my, my dad um, is, you know, from farm country, farm family, uh, haven't been able to get him to go veg. He's like, his meat is just like so much a part of his life. Um, but he's heard over the years, like uh, he, he's aware of the work I do. He knows about the suffering of animals. I know it doesn't sit well for him. And when uh, my friend Liz Marshall did her um, film, uh, The Future of what is the future meat? Um, and yeah. It, uh, yeah, about Memphis meats. And now, now, uh, what are they called now, Jenny? Upside. 
yeah, upside, so upside. And so I got him to, to watch that. And he came to me afterwards and he said, I would eat that. And I was like, really? <laughs> like, so here's like one of the most car- hardcore meat eaters. And he's like, yeah, I would do that. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. that is, that's how the world's going to change. Yeah, I totally agree. And I have a very similar father in the town of Innisfil, living in the house that I was born in. That was a dairy hand when he was 15 years old. And up until recently, he did not even realize the industrialization of agriculture because, you know, especially folks from the older generations, like they remember seeing cute little cows frolicking in fields when they were 10 years old. And they haven't really figured out that we went from 1 billion people then to 8 billion now. So it is, it's still largely unknown to a lot of people. Um, I, you know, I have a very, I, I have a controversial opinion of this. Uh, a lot of people ask me, they say like, when will the world go vegan? That's like one of the top questions I get asked when I do interviews all the time. And I don't believe the world will ever go vegan. I just don't think it's possible. But what I do think is possible is we can move towards uh, majority slaughter free technologies. You know, I think there is a lot, a lot, a lot of people that are going to keep eating meat. And there is nothing that a Beyond Burger will ever do to replace that. But a Beyond Burger that perhaps has some cultivated beef fat in it and perhaps a little bit more structure that's like the meat that they like, then we can get them to make the change. Um, The vast majority of folks that I work with in the space, many of them are vegans, these CEOs and these future food companies, like for everyone to understand, uh, many of them actually are originally animal activists and they realized... um, that cultivated meat and precision fermentation is the key. Uh, Uma Valetti, you know, Uma is very quiet about his veganism, but he is like vegan for the animals. Like we, we have conversations talking about how we want to blow the whole thing up. And then we realize we need to do it by working through the systems that we have, you know? So please understand to everyone up there that while you might not hear externally from these CEOs and these people about these very like vegan views, they're all there with us, um, but we just need to play the game. We need to play the game, you know, meets a trillion dollar industry. Uh Yeah. And so I do, there is a a, a certain type of vegan, uh, you know, uh, purity that, you know, a lot of, a lot of vegans and a lot of animal rights activists look down on cultivated meat, reduce efforts and everything. Um, And you're an ethical vegan and you're like, no, like this is, this is the way we have to go. Uh, You know, I always say um, ultimately you have to ask what's best for the animals, purity or progress. Um, So I love hearing that. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Okay. So I I also want to ask a little bit, you know, go back to the, uh, future food is female in that um, I, I, I think I heard you talk uh, about um, when you are asked to do a panel, um, you know, for, of CEOs, for example, you like, you're, you're likely to do all women. And so, uh, you know, just, you know, talking about how important this idea of representation is. Um, I know here in AJA, um, when we started uh, planning AJA three years ago, we were like, okay, this is going to be, we're going to, we want representation. We want to hear from people of, of everywhere. We want to, um, we want to hear not just the old uh, usual voices. And that was, I'm so glad we did that. It makes it, it's, a, it's more difficult. You have to do a lot more digging. You have to take some risks. Do you think that's what's sort of stopping other organizations and companies from that kind of representation or is there something else at play well first off we always favor status quo because it's easy that's human nature and so you take a look around and you take a look at who is normally talking about these things and you just kind of go to them and that's really where the media representation piece comes in our media continues to cover the same folks and again like these are great guys and I, you know, I work with them and many of them are my biggest sponsors and we're very close, but they, you know, they'll be the first ones to say like, have you called up these few founders as well? But the media, they, they like to go back to the same people over and over and over again. It's lazy journalism. Yeah. So I, you know, I think it's just, I, I honestly think it's laziness. Uh, if you don't create a diverse, you know, perspective, you know, set of perspectives in these conversations, like it's going to be an echo chamber. It is like, it absolutely is. It's, it doesn't, and this is a problem we do in the vegan space too. It's like 1% of us. We need to make sure that we are engaging people from all around the world. We need to make sure we're engaging people from 
blue states, red states, like there needs to be people from all across the spectrum that are participating in these conversations. And, you know, I actually wrote about this and I saw people referencing the impossible, um, impossible foods cracker barrel situation. I've got an op-ed that's being looked at right now talking Good. about the cultural warfare of alternative protein and, and you know, what, what's to come of that. And that's a, a real indication for us that we're not doing a good job. Like, I'll just be honest, like in the alternative protein space, we are not doing a good job of messaging and doing a good job on like a public affairs standpoint, like the meat industry has. And it's up to us to go to places like Omaha, Nebraska, and go to Arkansas and go to all of these places and be talking to people there. Because I find that many people in the alternative protein and, and even to the vegan space, it, a lot of times they'll be in coastal, more liberal places. They don't necessarily engage with the other parts of the population. I tell people all the time, like, when's the last time you went on a road trip? When's the last time you went to a flyover state? How many people do you know that voted for Donald Trump? Because if the answer is like no to any of those, you don't know how 50% of people are living in the United States. Like you're missing a lot of people and they buy food too. And they're just as much a part of the solution as anybody else could be. In many ways, um, you know, we could have completely different angles in terms of bringing conservatives on board. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with conservatives and Republicans, both in Canada and the US um, in terms of like the innovation and the jobs and the other really interesting angles of the future of food that we maybe haven't tapped into enough. Mm, yeah, I love it. And uh, Jenny, I think we have a, a friend in common, um, Ari Nessel, who's, um, yeah. you know, actually going across party lines and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it's been positively exhilarating for him, you know, to be able to see this response of, of, of Republican um, reps to him. So I, I love that. I love that message. Um, okay, we have a few minutes left and I want to get to a few uh, questions that have come up in the chat. And folks, if you do have uh, any other questions, just do uh, star, 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 Q or Q star stars just to, so it stands out. Um, Debbie is asking, uh, Jenny, what your favorite term is for cultivated, cultured, cell-based, biofarmed, slaughter-free meat and why? So I usually say cultivated meat and sometimes, or I'll say like the cell based industry. Uh, I have not, this is not like an area where I have this like massive opinion on it. I'm not new, I'm not GFI or New Harvest. I'm not building out like federal infrastructure support. So I honestly kind of go with where the interviewer takes it. I'll say cultivated meat. I, I do find most people are still calling it lab grown meat. And, oh, you know, I'll say like, all the time, like seriously, all the time. And so, you know, I'll say like, cause they meet like brackets, lab grown meat. Um, and I'm just really going for understandability. It's more important to me that I can have a conversation that is understood by people than it is to like take a stake in, in the nomenclature. That's me though. Cause I'm more of a brand and a media personality than entities like say the GFIs or New Harvest or, or any of them where they have a different mandate. Mm. Um, yes, it's, uh, you know, when they first came out with the term clean meat, I was like, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. But then it got buried. And I know there was some controversy and there was a lot of talk in the, in, you know, but what happened to clean meat? It's a, it's also a, clean meat is a ethical statement too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like there's a lot of, you also need to, to think that people might be offended by that and it actually might cause the opposite of what you're looking for. I so. see. I see. Got it. Nomen you're Honestly, like nomenclature is not the most important thing in the world. Yeah. It's yeah. really not. We are, we have other things to deal with. If you want my honest opinion, I know there's others that feel differently, but that's that's how I feel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And so uh, Jay, Jay is asking, what about bringing in more stars? And I think this was around the branding when we talk, we're talking about the branding problem. Uh, Serena is going to have more time now. Can you involve her? Now, Jenny, you're, you're actually quite an expert in involving celebrities. So tell, tell us about why that's particularly important for you. So there's really, really great data around the future of purchasing, okay? So like, let's talk about how consumers interact with brands. Like, like ads, like ad sales, they're dying, like they're dead. People don't really buy based of, off of ads anymore. If anybody here is like a marketing, you know, background, the way that people buy has hugely changed, especially in the last five years, especially with things like GDPR as well, um, in the way that ad tech can even work, we've largely regulated it. So how do people buy instead? 
They buy from people. That's, that's what influencer marketing is. That's where the creators come in. I think it's expected to increase by like 5 billion next year, influencer marketing spending. People are buying through relationships and it poses a very, very unique value proposition for us in the industry to be able to find value aligned creators and celebrities that can help to communicate these products to their audiences in a way that there is an established line of, of trust that is not there with an ad. Uh, especially when we're talking about something that is so seismic for people, like the kind of shift that it takes to not only switch what you eat, which is so dear to like who you are, and like very base of a person, but to like switch what you eat using like new technologies that might scare you as well. We need to make sure we have very trusted sources doing that. And, and I can tell you from, from an industry perspective, uh, there was actually a survey that was done recently, I'm not gonna say who it was, from a you know food tech company that it will be published in a few months, basically saying that our best chance at cultivated meat consumption getting picked up in the mainstream is through influencer marketing. Mm, wow, yeah, fascinating. So we need more of you to be influencers, folks. <laughs> um, Jenny, what, um, you know, last question, and that is you have um, a whole bunch of, of folks here who are hungry to do, to do stuff, to do work, to support you and support this mission. Um, what is the best thing, what are some of the best things that we could do to support you and support this, this mission? Well, I got to do this because it's what the publisher says. First off, <laughs> <I'm on double. laughs> I haven't had a chance to, to pick up the future of food as female. I've been doing a worldwide book tour. I've been to um, 12 different places. My most recent one was last week in Toronto. We had almost 100 people that came out in Toronto. Uh, it's available at Amazon anywhere. Please, you know, if you haven't had a chance, you know, hop on, grab a copy of the book. If you have already got the book, the best thing you could do for me is to leave a review. Um, Amazon reviews are tremendously important when it comes to the algorithm pushing it to new audiences. Uh, we ranked number one um, as a new release in six categories, including uh, like environmental science and non-animal related categories. So the wow. more I can get reviews in, the more people that would not normally pick up a vegan book might actually pick up this book. So that's on the short term, um, things that would be super helpful to me. From a long-term perspective, you know, it's really important that all of you I can't state this enough. Please like learn a little bit about what the future of food is and please learn a little bit about like the consumer side of things. I know that each of you are doing really amazing work to advocate for animals and reducing cruelty in the world. And you know, my heart is with all of you, but my mouth, when I'm speaking about things, I'm speaking about solutions to people. And I think it's important as you're having these conversations for people to realize that not only are you just saying, hey, don't eat this or don't do this, but hey, don't do this and look at the cool thing that you can do instead, right? Like you have to be very solutions oriented. And so I ple like, please, you know, as animal advocates become future of food advocates as well. Very, very important. Um, and if you want to be a part of the conversation, uh, VWS, we, we have the Vegan Women's Summit newsletter. It goes out every Wednesday um, to over 11,000 people. We had a 60 plus percent open rate yesterday. It's the only Ooh. newsletter that combines... Um, plant-based food, fashion, beauty, and animal-free biotechnology in one single newsletter. We email one time a week and we give you 16 different stories of women that are leading all around the world. So it's a good way to keep up to date with little like news snippets. So you kind of feel knowledgeable about what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, we do- It's an excellent uh, newsletter. I get it and it's wonderful. Yeah, I appreciate that. So that's just a good way to keep up on the industry a really like low barrier way to do it. Um, other things, we do the Vegan Women's Summit once a year. It's going to be announced very soon. It's coming back in May. 1,500 people we're going to have next year will be one of the biggest future food conferences in the world. Uh, oh. It's going to be wild. You're all invited. Please come. 80% of our attendees are women. 20% are men. Let's grow that 20% because this is a movement that needs everybody. I love it, Jenny. And I miss, I just missed your summit by a few days. I, I was out there for the lead, uh, lead for animals, farmed animals conference. And, and, uh, and I found out that I'd missed yours <laughs> and I was like, oh man. So next, next year it's a priority for sure. Um, all right. Yeah, good vibes. Um, yes. Good vibes. I've, I've heard so many wonderful things about it. Um, Kirsten, if you can take us off of spotlight and, um, Animal Justice Academy folks, can we just give uh, Jenny a big AJ thank you for being here and for teaching us so many of you.
beautiful, uh, important, vital things. Uh, Jenny, you are a force to be reckoned with. I love your energy. I love your brain. Um, thank you so much for being in this movement and um, uh, go get them, lady. Yeah, I'm, I'm here to do it. This is my North Star. Um, I'm not going anywhere. Watch, just watch me. We're yes. going to change the food system. I guarantee it. Uh, I'm a very persuasive person. So I, you know, with all of you here, let's do this thing. Let's kick ass. The future can be great and amazing and inspirational. And I can't wait for us all to get there.